Who or what is the little horn or antichrist power mentioned in Daniel 8? What does the Bible say about this end time power that bore out the saints of the Most High and stamped the residue with its feet? Who is the Antichrist? Was it Antiochus Epiphanes? Is it a tyrant from the Middle East? Prince Charles? The number of possible matches offered these days makes the issue confusing. What's certain is that he or it defies God, persecutes God's people and controls a one-world government or new world order at the end of time. Would God really leave to speculation an issue as important as the identity of the Antichrist? No. In fact, the Bible describes the unique features of the Antichrist in such detail and with such clarity that there can be no mistaking it for any other entity. For brevity, this list is taken mostly from Daniel 7. More information can be found in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2 John, and Revelation 13. Daniel 7 expands on the statue dream of Nebuchadnezzar and depicts four beasts in the same order as the sections of the statue, beginning with the lion as Babylon, the bear as Medo-Persia, the leopard with wings as Greece, and ending with a terrible beast with ten horns. Out of three of these ten horns comes a little horn power, otherwise known as the Antichrist. Daniel 7 verse 7 tells us that the Antichrist rose from the fourth kingdom. Behold, a fourth beast, and it had ten horns, and there was another horn, a little one, this point already eliminates Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who lived during the time of the Greek kingdom, which is the third kingdom mentioned by Daniel, not the fourth. The real Antichrist rises from the fourth kingdom, Rome, which followed Greece. So Rome ruled from 168 BC to 476 AD, it will divide into 10. How many toes did the previous prophecy depict? 10 toes. There we have the 10 again. Divide into 10. Another will arise after them. And he will be different. And the system will remain how long? Until the Ancient of Days shall come. Who? Long time. So we're talking about a long, long time span. Rome ruled from 168 BC to 476 AD, and then it was divided up. So we have exactly the same sequence. We have the lion depicting the head of gold. Then we have the bear depicting the arms and the chest of silver. We have this four-headed leopard representing the hips of bronze. And then we have the terrible beast representing the legs of iron. And the ten toes, when it divides into ten, plus it will be different because of another that arises after them. So that's what we have so far. Daniel chapter 7, verse 19 and 23. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse, different from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, bronze. So there was an element of bronze in this fourth beast. Bronze was a very important component. Now, in actual fact, the Greek empire was basically just incorporated by Rome. Greek philosophy was the very basis of the Roman Empire. And in fact, when Rome split into the two legs, 
The one was the Byzantine Empire and the other one the Western Empire. And the empire was ruled from Constantinople and that is where Greek philosophy abounded. Greek philosophy was the, the philosophy of the time. So there's this element of brass, of bronze. Bronze claws scratched. And we'll find uh, these nails also interestingly uh, elsewhere later on. Which devoured broken pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. So he wanted to know about this terrible fourth beast. The fourth beast, we are told in verse 23, shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and shall devour how much of the earth? The whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. The Antichrist doesn't appear until the Roman Empire split into ten kingdoms. When that happened, Daniel said the Antichrist power came up among them. The Roman Empire fell in 476 AD and broke into ten nations. This makes Antichrist a European power, eliminating contenders from Arabia or elsewhere. This is what the Bible says, there would be these kingdoms and ten horns would arise, ten kingdoms. Ten kingdoms represent the ten toes. Uh, 476 until the second coming of Christ. These powers would somehow continue and the little one after him that would arise later, he would be the different element and he would rule until the Ancient of Days came along. Daniel 2 verse 44, remember, talking about the ten toes, which are the equivalent of the ten horns, says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, Daniel was wondering about this. And in verse 8 it says, I was considering the horns. So he's looking down the stream of time and he's looking to where Rome divides up into ten components and he's looking at these ten kingdoms that arise out of the Roman Empire. And there was another horn, a little one. Actually it says from littleness. It was first small and then it grew bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Coming up, where does it come up? Among them. All right, so this little horn comes up among the ten. Very important because this little horn is the man behind the mask. And this little horn comes up amongst the ten. So the ten kingdoms are there and he arises amongst them. So what type of power is this? This is a European power because the ten horns arose out of the Western Roman Empire. So can we look for this little horn in the Middle East, for example, yes or no? No. Can we look for this little horn in the United States of America, for example? No. Where do we have to look for him? There where he's supposed to arise. He has to come up among the ten. He comes, comes up among the ten. And all ten are there when he arises. Because the Antichrist is said to rise after them, that is, after the empire breaks apart into the nations of Europe, we should look for the Antichrist sometime after 476 AD. Notice before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So because of this power, three of the ten had to be removed. Does that make sense? We're going to take three away. And who's going to take them away? Or as a consequence of whom will they be removed? This power. It's very important that we get him absolutely spot on because we don't want to make a mistake. 
All right, so now we have some history. He arises out of the division of the Roman Empire. Once it is divided into ten, then only does he make his appearance. Three of them are bothersome to him. They are eliminated under his influence. And then he rises up like a mushroom and sets man above the divine. That's what it says. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another, there he is, shall rise after them. Question, does he arise out of the remnant of the Roman Empire or out of the remnant of the Greek Empire? Roman Empire. Roman Empire. Don't forget that. The stone also struck the feet. It struck which empire? The Greek or the Roman Empire? The Roman Empire. So already if you know this, you should be able to solve half of the problem of false prophecy out there in the world that says that the Antichrist will arise or arose in the past in the time of Greece. No, no, no. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says he arises when once Rome is divided into its components. That's what the Bible says. Daniel 8 tells us that the Antichrist rises in conjunction with the destruction of three nations, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. The Heruli, Vandals and Ostrogoths are the three kingdoms that were eliminated. The last of these, the Ostrogoths, were defeated in 538 AD. So the Antichrist must appear between 476, the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, and 538, which marks the fall of the Ostrogoths. And he is the one that's responsible for removing three whole kingdoms. Well, you remember the kingdoms, the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Alemanni, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Suevi, and the Vandals. Those were the ten. But there were some terribly opposed to this power. Number one, the Heruli, A.D. 493. Look where they ruled. Look where they ruled. Now, these people had an interesting philosophy. And this philosophy differed substantially from the philosophy of this other little horn power. Now, unfortunately, we have no historic documents as to what the Hiruli believed. Neither do we have any historic documents as to what the Ostrogoths believed. We have a little bit of what the Vandals believed, but none of their religious documentation. Why not? Because it has all been destroyed. So we only have information from those secondhand. Apparently, history tells us today that these three powers that were re removed were Aryan in their view. In other words, that they taught that Jesus was not God and therefore had to be removed. But there is really no evidence for that whatsoever other than second-hand information by the very power that destroyed them. So they were destroyed 493 A.D. Now, if this creature, this fourth one, uh, this new power arose amongst them, then he must have arisen already before 493. The next one to go were the Vandals, A.D. 534. They plagued the Roman Empire and they subjected large parts of the religious culture of the Byzantine and Roman world, they subjected it ferociously. And so eventually the Vandals were also destroyed by the armies of the Eastern Empire. And then came the Ostrogoths. They were the last ones. The Ostrogoths ruled until 538 A.D., and they occupied first this area and later occupied and controlled the whole of the ancient Roman capital and surrounding areas. And so in 538 AD, 
the opposition to the little horn power disappeared and it rose like a mushroom. So the Alamani, the remnant of the ten, you know, the Germans today, the Burgundians, the Swiss, the Franks, the French, the Lombards, the Italians, the Saxons, the English, the Suevi, the Portuguese, the Visigoths, the Spanish, and the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths are eliminated, totally destroyed. In fact, these were the on, not the only ones that, uh, that waged war against, though. No, no, no. The Visigoths, for example, probably being very much related to the Ostrogoths, had similar sentiments, and there were many, many wars fought and much subjugation over here uh, before these came in line with the thinking of the Little Horn Power as well. The greatest ally of the Little Horn Power was the Franks, who are today the French, and the first one to adopt this robe upon himself was Clovis, and Clovis will go down in history as the man who more than any other helped the Little Horn Power to come to fruition. The Antichrist kingdom would rise to be greater than his fellows. In other words, it would be more powerful than the other remaining horns or kingdoms. more stout than his fellows, Daniel 7.20, he would be mightier than the other kings. Did the kings of Europe bow down to the papacy? Yes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. If no, eventually they were subjugated and did bow down. Eventually they did have to come like Frederick of Germany and stand barefoot in the snow waiting for a reprieve to get his kingdom back. The Most Holy Councils, Volume 13, Rome says, we define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy over how much of the world? The whole world. That's interesting. The Vicar of the Incarnate Son of God, anointed High Priest and Supreme Temporal Ruler, the Pope, sat in his tribunal impartially to judge between nation and nation, people and prince, sovereign and subject. Henry Connell Manning, Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ. So, did they say that they were in control of all the other kingdoms? Yes or no? Yes, they claim so themselves. Keys of this blood, Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for control of the new world order. Malachi Martin, pontifical professor at the Gregorian University in Rome itself. He's saying it, not me. The Antichrist kingdom would also be different from all other kingdoms. But how would it be different? Verse 25 tells us, He shall speak words against the Most High. While other nations concern themselves with secular issues, this power involves itself with religion. It was a religio-political power, combining church and state. So, he shall be different from the first. So, the flavor of the fourth beast is made different by whom? By him. Why different? He shall be different from the first. We saw that Rome says, yes, we're different. Because now it is a religious power that wields political clout. And there in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Where did we find this symbolism earlier? This man symbolism? Babylon, remember? Found it in Babylon. Here's the same symbolism. In this power, man will once again lift himself up above the Most High and take the place of the Most High. This is another Bab El, another portal to heaven. Man exalting himself above the divine with pompous words. He's speaking against God. The little horn has the eyes of a man. The Antichrist is an inspector or overseer, which is what a bishop is in religion. Eyes also represent intelligence and foresight. 
compared to the illiterate barbarian tribes around it, the Antichrist would be notably wise and educated. It has eyes like a man and it spoke great words against the Most High. Here's a system that sets itself up above God and will speak against the Most High. Let's first look at the biblical definition of blasphemy and see whether Rome qualifies. Well, we find it in John chapter 10, verse 30 and 33. I and the Father are one, says Jesus. Jesus says he's God. The Jews answered him saying, we do not stone you for a good work but for blasphemy and because you, being a man, make yourself God. So the one definition in the Bible of blasphemy is if someone says that he's God. Well, there are many blasphemers in the world today, but uh, that's the one definition. The other definition we find in Luke, where it says, and seeing their faith, he said to the man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins except God alone? So there are two biblical definitions of blasphemy. The one is, if you say that you are God, and the other one is if, if you say that you can forgive sins. Well, what does the Rome say? Here's the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, Article on the Pope. It says, this judicial authority will even include the power to pardon sin. So Rome says it can forgive sins. The Catholic priest, page 78, says, Seek where you will through heaven and earth, and you will find one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. Interesting. The outer priest forever, says the ordaining bishop, he is no longer a man, a sinful child of Adam, but an alter Christos, another Christ. That's interesting. Another Christ in the place of Jesus Christ, in the place of, in Greek is anti Christos, Antichrist, in the place of. Forever a priest of the Most High with power over the Almighty. Now that's heavy to say that you have more power than God. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself. Hidden under the veil of flesh, the Catholic National, July 1895. So Rome has always claimed that she is in the position of God. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon, according as they, the priests, refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. Dignities and Duties of the Priest, volume 12, page 27. Wow. So the Catholic Church says who is saved and who is lost, and God hasn't got a hope. He has to abide by their judgment. And if they say no, God can't say yes. So who's mightier, they or God? They are. Is this blasphemy, yes or no? This is blasphemy of the highest order. Cardinal Bellamine says, all names which in Scripture are applied to Christ by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. That means he assumes the place of God. So he qualifies on that count. Given in Rome from our palace the 10th of February 1817, the 15th jurisdiction of the Most Holy Pontiff and Father in Christ and our Lord, our God, the Pope Leo XII. So the Pope had himself crowned as God. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, the great ecclesiastical letters of Pope Leo. Did you know that when the papacy today writes an encyclical, it always signs the encyclical, Pope John Paul II, in other words, does this, given by us, capital letter, in our capital letter, pontificate. Interesting. Because God says, let us make man in our image. Capitals. So the papacy takes the prerogative and to this day, by their writing, they claim to have and be the power of God. So, 
Rome qualifies. The Most High Council. We define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff hold the primacy over the whole world. Now, this power would eventually take control of the whole world. Thomas Aquinas wrote, secular power, this is the great Catholic philosopher that is quoted by John Paul II more than any other philosopher of the Roman Catholic Church. He's, he writes, secular power is subject to the spiritual power as the body is subject to the soul. And therefore, it is not a usurpation of authority if the spiritual prelate interfere in temporal things concerning those matters in which the secular power is subject to him. So everybody is subject to Rome. The Council of Trent declared all temporal power is his. The dominion, the jurisdiction, and the government of the whole earth is his by divine right. All rulers of the earth are his subject and must submit to him. This characteristic he shall speak great words against the Most High, shows that this little horn power is exceedingly bold and arrogant in that he even challenges God in heaven. Revelation 13 verse 5 adds the detail that he speaks great words and blasphemies. According to the Bible, blasphemy is when a man claims he can forgive sins or when a man claims to be God. The Antichrist claims both, that he can forgive sins and that he claims to be God. And then he'll make war against the saints. He'll wear out the saints, verse 25. So this power must have been a persecuting power that fought against those who said, salvation is through the power of God alone. Did she wear out the saints? It was given him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Well, again, Thomas Aquinas said that convicted heretics should be put to death just as surely as other criminals. The Catholic Church is a respecter of conscience and of liberty. Nevertheless, when confronted with heresy, she has resource to force, to corporal punishment, to torture. She lit in Italy the funeral piles of the Inquisition. Catholic professor Alfred Budrat, the Catholic Church, Renaissance Protestantism. Yes, she admits it. Here is the Chiesa del Jesu, which is the seat of the Jesuits. Here is the Jesuit oath that is made which basically says that they can get rid of any heretical king in the entire world, any commonwealth of governments that does not want to subject itself to the papacy, and anybody who does not submit to the authority of the Roman pontiff can be safely destroyed. So the church ruled as the woman ruling over kings. That is how she depicted herself throughout history. The Inquisition... Well, the Inquisition tells us that she wore out the saints. What is the definition of heresy? Greek, heresis, choice. Deciding for oneself what one shall believe and practice. That's heresy. So who must decide for you? Rome must decide for you what you must believe. And if you do not fall in line with this, well, then you must be eliminated. You must be eradicated. And they killed Literally, millions and millions of people. This is the famous Huguenot monument in Africa where the French Huguenots escaped and uh, after the great massacre where the Huguenots were massacred, Bartholomew massacre, and they depicted themselves as a woman, a church escaping with a Bible in her hand and the chains of Rome torn loose. Well, I have news for you. This woman is once again chained. And every other woman on the planet, talking of churches, is once again chained. Perhaps the most well-known feature of the Antichrist is that he wars against God's people. Daniel 7 verse 21 tells us, The same horn made war with the saints. The Antichrist is a persecuting power.
And then another criterion, he'll change times and laws. Verse 25 says he'll think to change times and laws. That's fascinating. Now which times and which laws do you think uh, God would be concerned about? Would God be concerned about silly little human laws? No. It must be modification of divine law, and the times must be changing the times which God had set. For example, God set the time, and it shall be evening, and it shall be morning the first day, and it shall be evening, and it shall be morning the second day. From evening to evening went the day. That's the first time. Then there were feasts and festivals and times that were set. Would this power change all of that? Does the Pope claim that he changed God's law? Absolutely. De Cratal, de Translat, de Piscop. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That's arrogance of the highest order. So they say that they can change these things. Did the papacy change the times? Certainly did. What calendar are we keeping in the world today? Who knows? We're keeping the Gregorian calendar. Who was Gregory? He was a pope. And were the times changed? Yes. On the authority of whom? Of the Jesuit astronomers. What did they change? They changed Easter. They brought the Easter feasts to bring them in line with the Feast of Easter. They even called it that, Easter, Easter, Easter Feast. And so, whereas the Pash was celebrated according to the new moon, and the Passover could take place on any day of the week, depending on when the new moon was sighted, so the papacy changed it and followed the symbolism of the Sadducees, who were trained in Alexandria in occult teaching, and moved it in line with the Feast of Easter. And now Easter falls only on a Sunday, and never coincides with the Passover. It is possible with the calendar that they have, that at some stage in history, it can actually coincide with the Passover. And what does the papacy then decree, if there happens to be a lining up of the Passover with the Feast of Easter, then the papacy shifts Easter one week, so that it'll still fall on the Sunday. So she changed the times and the feasts, definitely. Also, since these times, we are celebrating the day from midnight to midnight, and not from sunset to sunset. And then did she abrogate the laws? and dispense with the things and the precepts of Christ. The Pope can modify divine law, prompta biblioteca. Who gives you the right, Mr. Pope, to change the law of God? The Ten Commandments, as originally given by God on the first tablet, you shall have no other gods before me. Then there is this big commandment that you shall not bow down to idols. And then you may not take the name of the Lord your vain. The Sabbath commandment is very prominent, and then you have the commandments dictating the relationship between man and man, honor your father and your mother, shalt not kill, adultery, uh, theft, thou shalt not bring false witness and covetousness. Those are the commandments as they are in the Bible. If you take the Catholic Catechism, you'll see that the second commandment has been removed. You shall not have other gods, he shall be able to change the laws, of course, he says. I am the Lord of God. You shall have no strange gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So the second commandment is gone. This one has moved one up. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. But what have they done to that? We'll see about that in a moment. And so they only have nine commandments. And to get ten, they take the commandment on coveting and split it into two. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife goods. Very fascinating. Remember that this one over here says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. So they turn it round. Isn't that fascinating? They even have the gall to turn it round, as if they had the right to do that. The Catholic Encyclopedia says, the church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath, 
Well, the seventh day of the week to the first made the third commandment referred to Sunday, because the second one was gone now, as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's Day, Catholic Encyclopedia. So they changed the times. Even the day of worship, which was the seventh day, was shifted to the first day of the week. Matthew 5, 17 says, Think not that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy but to fulfill, to live them out. Here's the Converts Catechism of the Catholic Doctrine, page 50. And it says, question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Catholic Church is well aware of it. They know it. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from the Saturday to the Sunday. So did she change times and laws, yes or no? Yes, she did. Daniel 7 verse 25 says the Antichrist power will think to change times and laws. Part of the Antichrist's great words against God and persecution against his people has to do with thinking he can change times and laws. The laws here referred to are God's laws, the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath command is the only one that deals with time. So, in a very particular sense, this power attempts to change the Fourth Commandment. Interestingly, another place where changing times is mentioned is in Daniel 2. There, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges God as the sovereign ruler of history who removeth kings and setteth up kings. Applied in this sense, then, to think to change times and laws means that the Antichrist attempts to usurp God's place in shaping history through political maneuverings such as removing and setting up kings. And he will rule, they shall be given into his hand unto a time, times, and the dividing of a time. Time, times, and half a time. If you have a modern Bible, it'll say three and a half years. Now, prophetic years are different to normal years. A year, in a prophetic sense, had 360 days because the Hebrew year had 360 days. So, 360, two times, 720, half a time, half a year, 180. Add them all up, that would give you 1,260 prophetic days. Now, that becomes 1,260 literal years. Let's just sort this out. With the conquest of Rome by Belisarius commences the history of the Middle Ages. So when Rome was conquered and the Ostrogoths were removed, the history of the Middle Ages started. Philip Shape says, Vigilus ascended the papal chair 538 A.D., under the military protection of Belisarius. So when did the Little Horn power assume its authority? The answer is 538 AD, because the last of the Little Horns, or of the Horn powers that kept him back were the Ostrogoths. They were removed in 538 AD, and Vigilus ascends the papal chair. So the dominance of Rome begins. Another shall arise after them, the Ten Kingdoms, established A.D. 476. After them, A.D. 538, papal rule commences. According to a decree which was issued by Justinian, emperor of Rome, who said that the Pope will be the corrector of heretics and the ruler of all the churches. Now, 538... If you add 1,260, you come to 1,798. 1798. What happened in 1798? Berthier entered Rome on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed the Republic. Half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed and that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. So exactly according to prophetic time, and the Bible tells us to take a day for a year, exactly according to that time, when the clock struck, 
1798, the temporal power of the papacy was halted for a while. So 1,260-year time prophecy. 476 AD, the ten kingdoms are established. 538 AD, the bishop officially recognized as the ruler of all the churches. 1,260 years of time prophecy brings us to 1798 fulfilled. His domain and dominion ended. The Antichrist exercises power over the saints of the Most High and they shall be given into his hand for a period of a time and times and the dividing of time. A time is a year, times is two years and the dividing of time is half a year. According to the day-year principle, persecution of the saints is limited to three and a half prophetic years or 1,260 years. and shall devour the whole earth. The fourth beast, which shall be different, shall devour the whole earth. The different component of it shall devour the whole earth and shall trample it and crush it. Does that include the United States of America? Uh -huh. Do you think you're being controlled by someone else? Do you think you might be being, right now, being controlled by someone else? The mighty USA, do you think so? What about the mighty Russia? What about any mighty nation? What about China? Do you think they might be controlled right now by someone else? And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Does that include the United States? Does that include my country? Yes, it does. Ronald Reagan and the papacy made a holy alliance. That's a fascinating story. We'll have to go into that into a little bit more detail. And so, even the mighty United States subjected itself to this power. Here we have a signal picture between Gorbachev and the papacy. This is the mighty Soviet Union at that stage, greeting and acknowledging this power. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in a common cause. Only the United States has both the moral standing and the means to back it up. At the Second Vatican Council, this was a 1962 document, it states, It is our duty, therefore, to strain every muscle in working for the time when all war will be completely outlawed by international consent. This is the Second Vatican Council. This goal undoubtedly requires the establishment of a universal public authority acknowledged as such by all and endowed with the power to safeguard on behalf of all security, regard for justice, and respect for rights. Pope Paul VI wrote in the section entitled Towards Effective World Authority, he wrote, this international collaboration on a worldwide scale requires institutions that will prepare, coordinate, direct it, until finally there is established an order of justice which is universally recognized. Who does not see the necessity of thus establishing progressively a world authority capable of acting effectively in judicial and political sectors? Fascinating stuff. And who was crowned ruler of the whole world? This man himself. Fascinating. What did uh, George W. Bush say about this power? The best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teachings seriously, is to listen to his words and put his words and teachings into action here in America. This is a challenge we must accept. So who is subject to who here? Who is subject to who? In 1991, the Pope called for a new world order. Well, what was his New Year's speech about this year? He had only one message. And he said, it's time to establish the world authority right now. That was his request. 
He visited the United Nations. He spoke on behalf of all the religions in the entire world. Now, please note that that includes Buddhism and Hinduism and Shintoism and Zoroastrianism and Protestantism and Catholicism and the whole shooting match. Is there an agenda? The Antichrist power is universal in that we're told he shall devour the whole earth. Revelation 13 verse 3 adds that all the world would be captivated by it. And it exists till the end, until the Ancient of Days came. Verse 22. Now, I'm not making this up. This is in the book of Daniel. You can get the book of Daniel yourselves and you can read it. Daniel 7 verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So Daniel is watching the events down here on earth, which all seem to revolve around this little horn power, and he sees a great judgment scene taking place in heaven. Verse 10 says, The judgment was set and the books were opened. So here is a judgment scene. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man, come with the clouds of heaven, that's an acronym for angels. We'll see that in a later lecture. And came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Verse 13. So this is not the coming of Christ to this earth. This is a scene that takes place in heaven as the little horn power sets up his domain here on this earth so the judgment is ready to sit in the heavenly realm. It is also a long-lasting power because Daniel says his war with the saints would go on until the Ancient of Days came. This feature rules out any individual, but points to a system that's been increasing in power since the 5th century AD. And the final criterion, his dominion will be taken away at the end of time. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. The Bible says he shall be destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's coming. So no earthly power is going to take his power away. God himself is going to intervene. There is only one power in the whole wide world, historically and otherwise, that can qualify. There is only one entity that has all the characteristics the Bible attributes to the Antichrist. It is the Roman Catholic Church. It can be no other. Incidentally, the word Catholic comes from a Greek term meaning universal. And while Antichrist can mean one who is against Christ or opposed to him, the Greek prefix anti also means before, as in antipasto, food served before the main course. But anti also means instead of or in the place of. The Antichrist then is a power that is against Christ while standing in the place of Christ. The Latin equivalent of one who stands in the place of Christ is Vicar of Christ, which is a title of the Pope. Find out how the papacy came to power and the circumstances surrounding its rise to power. The principles of liberty of conscience were at stake. Freedom of speech and freedom to hold your own personal views were all at stake. Learn more in Conviction Episode 1 and be part of the exclusive premiere only on ADTV.watch on August 12th. But in order to do that, you need to go to ADTV.watch, sign up by August 11th to receive your passcode for the exclusive viewing. Go to ADTV.watch now.